There is a large category of people who consider themselves watch lovers, but to them are spending on average between one to three hundred dollars per watch. And buying something that nears or goes a little bit over a thousand dollars is sort of like many other people getting a several thousand dollar watch, meaning it is a huge splurge from them. They do it once in a while, if that, and they want something that like makes them feel like they're wearing a five or six or seven thousand dollar watch and that's where this sort of comes in so this actually has to remind them of a bunch of other stuff or else it's not really doing its job greetings and welcome to this week's a blog to watch weekly we are joined by a rather sleepy ariel so just whisper nice and quietly because i think he's next door to some other people they're not going to want to be knocking on the wall telling them to shut up talking about watch at half past two in the morning. So we'll just speak nice and quietly. Ariel, how are you this morning? Um, Yeah, there's no one in the same room with me, but thank you for the uh, consideration. <laughs> I, I kinda, I'm more, I'm more, no, no, I, I wasn't, I went like next door. Like, it's not the same room, like your next door neighbor in your hotel room doesn't want to hear you speaking about watches and guffawing at half past two in the morning. Yeah, we're Americans. We have like a right to be loud in our hotel rooms. That's what we strongly believe. <laughs> It's it's that. How many amendments are there to the American Constitution? Come on, civics, civics one hundred and one. How many amendments? How many amendments to the ma- yeah. Why why is this relevant? There's not there's no amend there's no amendments about this. <laughs> no, I was going to say that the next of the last final amendment to the American Constitution is the right for Americans to make noise. Um, I mean, we basically have that already. <laughs> Free speech is as loud as you like. Almost as loud as we like. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're joined by a slightly noisier because he's, I mean, he is a Yorkshireman and Yorkshiremen basically consider themselves to have the freedom of everything. And he's also from Wales and everybody I've ever met from Wales talks loudly. We have Simon from Escapement 24. Morning, Simon. Good morning. I, I, I don't know whether really Yorkshiremen or Welsh people are that noisy, really, but um, that's a new one on me. You know, I think the Welsh, I think the Welsh are quite, every Welsh person I know walks into it and is like, hello, obviously in a Welsh accent. I thought that, that was the Scottish, connection. I thought that was just Jody from uh, Just One More Watch. I want to know what, <laughs> what, what people who are not familiar with the UK even think about these, uh, <laughs> this discussion here. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, everywhere you go, the Welsh sing. Yeah, yeah now that a is true. of singers. Yeah, I have this standing joke with my wife, who's Welsh, um, about Welsh people kind of spontaneously bursting into song at every opportunity. And I'm sure some of them are very good singers. And as much as my wife likes to think she can sing, um, she wouldn't mind me saying that she's definitely no Beyonce. And put it this way, Mariah Carey's job is definitely safe for now. Whistlers and singers. Like if I was good at singing, I would do that too. I'd be like, hey, let me flaunt what I'm good at. Yeah, I've met a few who really aren't pretty good at it. um, And you really don't want to hear them. (laughs) Uh, Well, then leave karaoke, please. (laughs) Exactly. Uh, But it's like not karaoke stores that are singing in. It's like the Argos... Tesco boots they're just bursting into song randomly throughout the world oh uh, Ariel if the Welsh are known for singing what are people from LA known for um having certain types of conversations which are not polite to have anywhere else in the world which is basically just talking about food fitness and entertainment if this is exclusively what you talk about in most other places you'd be considered shallow and not particularly <laughs> Um, part of a serious adult conversation. If you talk about anything but this in LA, you must have <laughs> some serious social issues. Is, is this like you're in the industry? Because everyone's in the industry or trying to get into the industry. It's it's complicated, but it's just sort of like, you know, it, amongst people who grew up there or have just been there for a long time, it's like you're in public and you're talking about something that isn't that. What, what do you do? No one wants to have a bad time. <laughs> All right, okay, so no one talks about anything that's actually consequential. No, like I'll travel like I am now and people start talking about politics. I'm like, I'm like, it's just, it's fresh. It's like, oh, people talk about this. Like that just doesn't happen in LA. It's like, you're going to disagree, just shut up. So are you, you, is your disagreeableness repressed? I'm literally a professional critic, right? So I had to go to the internet because living in California was stifling for me. (laughs) <laughs> your inner critic is stifled yeah. well let's open up your inner critic this morning and let's start by opening up on the only watch 2023 collection we've touched on a few from the last couple of weeks we're going to pick three more this morning simon see if you can pick a watch from only watch that we haven't discussed in the last two weeks as i'll show whether you're paying attention do you have a favorite or a 
one you would like to be overly critical of, seen as Ariel's in that kind of mood mm-hmm. this morning? Well, surprise, surprise, one that jumped out at me was uh, the release from Tudor. Um, so Tudor have uh, released this chronograph, which is a solid gold case, um, 18 karat gold, solid yellow gold. Um, it's what they're calling kind of a big block chronograph. Um, and I think that um, this is, I mean, look, it's right in Tudor's wheelhouse, isn't it? I mean, you know, you if you took the brand off this one and looked at it, you'd know exactly what it was. Um, but I think um, it's a, an interesting release. Of, they've used, um, or they're, they're prototyping a new um, in-house movement in it as well, which be interesting to see whether this makes it through actually into Tudor's um, existing model line um, or, or some of them. Do we not think it's inevitable that they've already got these ready to roll in stainless steel? Yeah, I think um, I think it's very, very likely that that's going to happen. I think um, you know they're probably using only watches the test bed for it um, to to garner some publicity. Um, you know, and who knows? I mean, maybe there'll be a, a steel and gold one and several other variants if we know Tudor. Uh, but it's a it's a it's a great looking watch. Um, you know, it's it reminds me a lot of uh, my Tudor Black Bay S and G Chrono. Um, in many ways, you know, there's a more than a hint of Rolex Daytona in there as well. Um, but yeah, it'll be uh, be quite interesting with this one, I think, to see um, what this achieves at Only Watch. Ariel, thoughts on this, Tudor? I mean, I think it's very clear that Tudor is trying to solicit feedback. They want to know what people are going to say in the comments. If there's a lot of people saying, oh, yeah, I can't wait to get that. If people are having the discussion we are, and they're like, well, looks like people are expecting a steel watch. We better do it. Um, this is definitely an experiment. And they also also can always fall back on, well, this was just for only watch. We never really planned on making more of these. Is it plausible? Yes. Um, you know, Tudor needs to have a roadmap ahead of them. So I think what's going to happen is they're going to have this. And it's not like all of a sudden these are going to be the next models. It could, it could be the next several years. But if the investment value for brands in participating in only watch is the marketing and media value, then this is exactly what they want to, to see how the community responds. So give us the over under on how quickly you think Tudor will release a similar watch in stainless steel. Will they wait as long as next year's watches and wonders? So we watches and wonders 2024 or will it be later than that? Um, Again, bigger, uh, personalities have failed trying to predict Rolex Group, you know, um, strategy, right? So I, I don't think there's any point in trying to sit there and guess. I think what is safe to to do is look at the collection at Tudor and ask yourself, what are the really strong chronographs? And the Black Bay chronograph is still just a Black Bay. It's not its own pillar. Rolex has the Daytona, which is like just a chronograph pillar. And so Tudor... Uh, doesn't really have a a successful just chronograph pillar the uh, the ceramic ones the the you know the fast back or whatever the fast shield whatever those things were um, <laughs> those they were okay they never really did that well so I think that it it makes sense for them to try to discover what is their chronograph um, product pillar going to be yeah and I think what's also interesting with this one is um, the naming on the dial so they've called this the Prince chronograph and it just makes you wonder whether that's a little hint as to whether we're going to be seeing a new Prince model line, possibly. I actually, well, the Prince is always coming back. I think that the funny thing is they reserved not naming it. So for me, Prince Chronograph is actually less exciting and more like they specifically decided to not give it a name that they're planning on giving. Uh, interesting. Right. So you think that's all appear, but called something entirely different? Yeah. And that will be the change from Only Watch. Yeah. I mean, again, they're just trying to figure out exactly what they want to do with this because they haven't done anything really interesting in Chronograph other than make Chronograph versions of the Black Bay, which are lovely. But still, you know, if you look at, at Rolex, they don't have like the Submariner and the Submariner Diver. Like it's it doesn't work that way. Maybe they should. Maybe they should. But um, I think they're looking to have a Chronograph pillar, something that's saying like you can't afford the Daytona. Well, get this, because the Black Bay chronograph is sort of that, but also isn't that. Ariel, a selection of another only watch from you that you think is worthy of discussion? I can't even remember all the ones we've discussed. <laughs> you know what I'm thinking, actually, is I usually, Ublo is so exciting, and like I can't, I can't remember what Ublo did this time. And there's a good question. Are Ublo there? I have not seen I haven't seen a, a or, 
or if there is one, it has not jumped out at me. I, Interesting. Because they're in alphabetical order. So let me just scroll down. A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H. We have Gronfell, Gerard, Perigo, H, Moser, er, there, No, we do have an Ubo. Oh, yeah, yeah, right. What is it? So it's the Takishi Mura, uh, Murakami Turbion only watch. Oh, yeah. So uh, this is like... How could I forget like that one? Well, well, I know this on one. the one hand, yes, how could you? Now that I'm looking at it, but on the other hand, yeah, it doesn't really look like a watch, although it is. So it's got the kind of uh, Murakami flower, but that's actually the bezel. Yeah. And it's a huge bezel. Oh, uh, yeah. So uh, with all I the mean, it'll, diamonds it'll do and gemstones. Well. I was at some of their Murakami events and that crowd is crazy. Um, yeah. You know, still thinking about it, you know, the the Gerald Genta with the uh, Mickey Mouse birthday dial that that's still for me. If I had to choose a, a watch, I mean, that is, that is for me, my absolute top top pick. And is it, is it correct that Patek Philippe hasn't even announced what theirs is yet? Uh, yeah. They, they are just going with this picture of the father and son team that we spoke about the other week that the son has made a watch in honor of the father. So Ugh. yeah, it's it's still <laughs> the the cheese is the cheese is still melting on that one. I love Ariel's sigh on that. That was just all grown. I should you say. know what the that sigh is? Brilliant. The sigh is the pretentiousness that anyone outside the family cares. Like that, the son <laughs> made the watch for the father. Lovely. Keep it in the friggin' family. Don't convince someone else they should be paying for that. That's for your family. You know what you should make them pay for? The cool watch you made for them, not for your dad. If my son made a watch for me, it'd be probably made out of like lots of different bits of cut up paper glued together with Pritt stick and cello tape. But it wouldn't be like, and he designed it for me. <laughs> now you buy it. Like that's just weird. <laughs> uh, yeah. So we're going to talk about Gerald Genta in a bit, but for this Mickey Mouse watch, which is estimated three hundred fifty thousand to five hundred thousand, which seems an extraordinary estimate for Mickey's a hundred. Yeah, yeah. Uh, what do we think this will actually get? I mean, presumably they can't let it go for less than that value. That would be highly embarrassing. So, Ariel, how much over the 500 grand do you think it will go? Or do you mean to do what I normally do, which I give you a number and you either agree to it or not? I'm going to go with the second choice. <laughs> <laughs> I'm saying for you, I think you think this will go for about three quarters of a million. I'm not sure this can go for over a million. I don't, I don't think it's go just for, a watch. I don't think it could go for over just, a million because um, there just isn't the culture for Disney. Still, still too many people worry. They're like, is someone going to want Mickey so that much? I, I'm going to argue yes. Yeah. Um, you have original artwork. You have like little like special Easter eggs in there. Um, you really have the first return to Genta watch. It's a it's a real cool collector's item. Forget the fact that it's like a, you know, a minute repeater and all that stuff. Just the and this is an enamel dial. This is made by hand. And again, Disney doesn't just allow everyone to do original artwork. So like this is this is actually a really interesting Disney collector's item as well. Um it it, it you know, I talked to LVMH about it and, you know, they rolled their eyes talking about all the jumps, the hoops they had to jump through because this was such a complicated thing. And, you know, re really Disney just wanted to continue. If they hadn't had this relationship, you know, in the, in, in, in the 80s, there's no chance Disney would be like, sure. <laughs> so <laughs> Disney was really into respecting what they had done in the past and continuing it. But this is not a door that LVMH could open right now. So from that sort of collectability issue, for me, that's a strong, it, it is it is a good only watch. But again, I don't really like to talk about prices because frankly, I don't think it matters. It doesn't matter what the price goes for. I think what's more interesting is us discussing the product and, and what, it, what it makes us feel. But think about the children, Ariel. Of course it matters. Um, what children? <laughs> is it the, the money raising for the children. Okay. In all the years that it has done this, have they issued any release of any kind talking about any of the good that they've done? The answer is no. And usually these types of entities are so excited about any opportunity to self-aggrandize. So the fact that they haven't like sat there and rested on their on their on their charitable laurels, I think is somewhat indicative of what the questions they don't want you to ask are. <laughs> I, need, I need to get with the program because I thought we were still talking about the Hublot and I'm thinking, where the hell is the Mickey Mouse appearing on the Hublot? Is it on the case back? Oh. Is it under that What's flower? That? Does the flower lift up and it's under there? Where is it? <laughs> Both of those, the Murakami and the Genta, will both do very well in Japan. Very well. 
Okay, so I'm putting Ariel down for 750k huh. for the Gerald Genta. Uh, Simon, give us a price for the Tudor. So I think the guide price on the Tudor, it's uh, something like 35,000 to 50, I think. Uh, or 25,000 to 35,000. Um, like it's it's going to go for at least double that, isn't it? I mean, you know, that's not far off what you'd pay for a, a Rolex Daytona on the high street. Not that you can buy one on the high street. Um, so I'd say, uh, who knows, that's going to go for 75. Yeah, I think it might go for significantly more than that. Oh, OK. Did one of the previous Tudors not go for like really stupid money, like half a million or something daft? Oh, was that so, the, um, the 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 all black full ceramic, the full one. ceramic one? Yeah. It did, didn't it? Yeah, yeah, thought, yeah. Good point. I thought that went for went for silly money. Mm, I think it but, is. Uh, we'll see. So maybe, and I'll just I'm just going to name numbers. For Ariel thinks it's going to go for, I don't know, forty grand. So I'm putting Ariel down for forty k. So so far, Ariel, you've spent seven hundred and ninety thousand dollars. I hope that you're ah, all right with that. Wow, what well, do you know? And then the Ublo, as soon as we talked about it, the Ublo scheduled about the same as the Mickey Mouse three fifty to four hundred. Is the Ublo going to attract more attention than Agenta Mickey Mouse? Hmm. I think it probably goes for more than the Mickey Mouse. Mm, I think it Do will. I think more. I think it's more. more than the Mickey Mouse for the Ublo. Is this a bit like? Is this game a bit like the um? What was it? The show Play Your Cards Right, where you've got to say higher, Play higher, your cards than, right, higher or yeah. lower. Oh, that's higher right. than half a million. Look, yeah. Is the Ublo higher than Agenta? You think it is? I think it is. Yeah. So let's let's put the Ublo in for a million quid. So Ariel, you've spent uh, one point seven uh, nine million dollars. That works. You're all right with that. Mm. Uh, that's, that's that's how we do. If I was doing auctions, that's how long you we know. I take. I blog about and watch products, it not watch prices. This is not my expertise. <laughs> <laughs> Right, well, we've touched there on a little bit of Gerald Genta, so let's speak about a superlative show that's just gone out, uh, Ariel interviewing Evelyn Genta, uh, Gerald's wife. Ariel, tell us how you got on. Had you spoken to her before? Yes, uh, Evelyn and I have met at a number of events, and I mentioned to her a while ago that it would be you know, an honor to have her on the show, and she accepted, and it was very gracious of her. She's a very interesting person to speak to, She's intelligent. She has an interesting job as a diplomat um, to Monaco in the UK. And she also maintains, you know, in a lot of ways, the uh, likeness of her late husband, Gerald Genta. So she's a businesswoman. Um, she's in politics. Uh, she's sort of, you know, lives in the world of luxury and personalities and things like that. And she's a very dynamic and actually funny person. She has a great sense of humor. She loves to speak about Gerald. It's very charming. I feel sad in a lot of ways because this is her dead husband. We have to remember this. And she's constantly being asked to talk about him and remember him. And it's in some ways, maybe it's nice because it's sort of like he's still around. In other ways, it might be hard. Um, you know, She has uh, a daughter who she does a lot of this with and who assists. And part of her life is uh, there's, a, there's a foundation, the Gerald Genta Foundation, so it's interesting to see, hear her opinions about the brands that are keeping his name alive and others that may be using his name but aren't necessarily, in her opinion, as entitled to it, to talk about how Gerald Genta himself you know, saw what he did. There's been, a, there's been a lot of rumors, to be honest, about, oh, Gerald didn't like watches or Gerald this and Gerald that. I've seen <laughs> totally conflicting opinions out there about you know, who people thought he was. And, you know, she gave it um, her best shot to explain. Obviously, it was her husband. She knew him well. And he was very expressive about what he likes. He was very much an artist, but he grew up in in, in a place where um, jewelry and watchmaking was a thing. So he had an interesting life. You know, she joined him at, at some point and saw that. And now, you know, posthumously, he has fame and recognition that far exceeds what he had during his life. And she starts still alive to see this. And I just think the psychology of all this is is kind of interesting. And and she indulges in that conversation, gets into it a little bit. But um definitely I think what's also important is that the Gerald Genta brand right now, through La Fabrique du Toms and LVMH, um, it doesn't officially have her as an employee or anything like that, but they call her in. Uh, they consult with her. They ask her opinion. Um, there are designs he hasn't done yet. 
I remember um, uh, Michelle and Enrico, who are the, the 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 heads of La Fabrique du Tom's, they worked with Gerald Genta at his own brand, making his sonneries and tourbillons and stuff like that. So this is a, a very natural reboot. And, you know, in entertainment, we have so much reboots and things like that. This is not a revival of a brand. This isn't a real sense of reboot, which I think is quite interesting. Um, and again, she doesn't have a, a direct business incentive in, in the brand's performance at all, but she obviously has incentive in the name of the, uh, in the value of the, of the Gerald Genta name. So um, this was, a, I think, a very deep and interesting conversation with a person that people should get to know. And so does she see the whole Genta obsession, maybe that's the right word for it, from the watch world? Does she see it in the kind of peaks and troughs since his death? And does she see that we're approaching a peak or going into a trough? Like, is she particularly excited by what is happening with the Gerald Genta brand itself, as opposed to just all of those watch brands that are pastiching the Gerald Genta look? Like, is she particularly excited about the fact that his name is now being revitalized within a watch brand as opposed to just his design cues which everybody's th frankly thieving from from around the watch world mm. is she even aware of all of the other watch brands that are pastiching yeah his that's design? a good point like does she know about micro brands she she knows about some she's pretty well informed not about everything she's pretty well informed she definitely has some strong opinions about things i don't think her incentive is to support herself financially through his likeness and image I think that given her background and given the context, she lives in a world where preservation of art, history, museums, legacy, these are all very valued uh, endeavors that people uh, uh, ascribe to do. And now she has you know, her late husband's body of work, <clears throat> his unpublished designs. He's had all these drawings and paintings and things like that. You know the 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 famous brands who now make very expensive products that are, they openly say were designed by him. I don't think she needs to think about trends. I think it just she needs to say as long as Patek Philippe, Audemars Piguet, and a handful of other names are brands with any strength, any momentum, they will push Gerald's name what to do with that name, exactly how to benefit from it or how to safeguard it. I think she makes it up as she goes along. I think that's normal. But I think that she's mostly in it out of a sense of duty and obligation to do something with his work. Uh, she genuinely care and fond of his memory and, of course, him. Um, but it, it doesn't strike me, though, she's trying to earn a living for herself through any of these activities. Does she give any inclinations to the future where, like, what ambition she has for his name, or is, as it seems to be what you said, she's just quite laid back about the whole thing. Well, and so all his folk are behaving respectfully, then she's not that bothered. Look, the Gerald Genta brand is just starting in its relaunch. They haven't even shipped, you know, announced the first commercial product yet. So she's going to be doing traveling, I'm sure, and touring, and media is going to want to speak to her. And I, I think that that's going to be a natural thing, which is going to happen for a while. So I think she has that to look forward to. Um, I don't know exactly how it's going to perform and I don't really care, but definitely Gerald Gent is a name that in the auction world is going to be mentioned more. And she lives in close proximity to a lot of, a lot of that. And she, you know, knows a lot of those people. So there'll be a lot of things for her to go to. So I guess in terms of her being busy and having a lot of things to do, she definitely is going to have a lot to do. So is she excited about that? I, I, I don't know, but I think that she loves the fact that she got lucky enough that she's part of something that continues to be relevant. Very few people um, do that, you know, where you you are with someone who, um, you know, gets famous and then you have to help maintain that legacy. So I think she's excited by the fact that maybe she wouldn't necessarily have something as interesting to do in this in this time of her life. And this is a this is this is a novel thing. People would love to have this this problem. It's an interesting sort of fame. Because it's the kind of, like, being famous, like, sideways famous as she is because of the name and her relationship in the world of luxury is 
so it's not the kind of fame that folk are going to recognise you walking down the street or recognise your voice mm. or maybe even have a lot of name recognition. But the people that know really know. If you so know, it's you kind know. of like digital. Yeah, it's kind of like digital fame. It's not that people kind of yeah I think if I I yeah, heard of that person I, I watched their TV show back in the day or listened to the music or my mum and dad liked them that kind of fame like that just kind of fades. It's the kind of fame that either you know who this person is and if you know them then to you they're really significant or you've never heard of them at all so i can imagine it's kind of weird like you know you could probably go anonymously i mean okay she's the ambassador to monaco i dare say that that comes with a certain amount of social airs and graces but it's probably one of these things that you know you could go weeks and nobody has a clue and then somebody just hears your surname and they happen to be in the industry or no and you know the fame goes from zero to a hundred must be quite a weird it's quite a weird thing to be famous for you know a real a real niche sort of fame yeah because you, be i guess you're completely to anonymous to so much of the population aren't you because, let me let yeah, me say how yeah. she sees it and i think this is a good analogy it's basically like being married to a famous dead artist mm. So there's the body of work, there's the things that he found important, there's the things he celebrated for, his masterpieces, so to say, his greater body of work, you know, this this collector or slash brand owns this piece, this collector slash brand owns this piece over here. So she feels like she's curating the body of work uh, of an artist, not necessarily a business owner or an inventor or an industrial designer. And that's how he saw himself. So that's, I think, the best way of understanding how she sees her role. Well, we do happen to have a couple of watches this week that is fair to say there is some Gerald Genta likenesses. So let's have a chat about them. Okay, first up from Bulova, the Bulova, 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 Bulova. I, I, it's one of these words that when you say it too often, it sounds yeah, a bit Yeah, I weird. never know how uh, to pronounce Bulova, that one either. <laughs> the Bill of a Jet Star watch revives a 1970s design. There's your hint that there might be some Genta esque design cues in this and runs on high frequency quartz. What do we think of this? Anybody familiar with the previous iteration of this watch from the 1970s? This is a revival after all. Yeah, so the, the Jet Star is one that I've seen. Um, you know, I mean, Jet Stars pop up on uh, sites like eBay quite frequently, um, the original ones. Um, I think that this is a, a pretty faithful recreation um, from what I've seen of it. Um, but what I really like about this is that they've used the um, 262 kilohertz movement, the height there, uh, so it's below this high frequency quartz movement um, in this watch, which I think is one of the unsung heroes in terms of watch movements. Um, you know, it really doesn't get the attention I think that this movement deserves because the accuracy is extremely high. Um, I think that it's, um, from memory, it's something like um, between kind of 10 and 20 seconds a year um, accuracy. Um, and, you know, you can pick watches up with this movement in for, you know, 300 bucks. Um, so it's, um, yeah, it, and, and also the, the other thing is you get this incredibly smooth sweep on the second hand. Um, with this movement, which um, due to the frequency it runs at. Um, so I think this is a great re-release from Belova. Belova, below, yeah, however you say it. I think this is a <laughs> really great re-release. Um, I like the fact that they keep delving back into their archives and and because they, they do have a, a, a huge back catalogue um, to go through with some incredible watches in it. And yeah, you know, it's a, it's a brand very much that um, in my younger days, it was kind of almost like a, an Argos catalogue. Um, I don't know if Ariel will, will know that um, <laughs> example, but, you know, we, we used to have this store that, that you, you know, well, we've still got this store that you basically will sell a whole range of um, things, but including kind of budget watches, um, you know, and as someone who has always liked watches, you would kind of I'd walk past them and sort of dismiss them all. Um, and it was a brand that for a long time I associated with that. Um, and since discovering this movement in particular, you know, I have a huge respect 
for the Belova brand. It's definitely undervalued. This movement really debuted 11 years ago now in the Precisionist. Uh, it started as a chronograph, and then they brought this three-hand version into it. And as Simon said, there's a lot of really great features about this. It never caught on very well. It was never priced that high. It was always priced very well. Um, Bulova was just never able to figure out <clears throat> the right design. And the Jetstar is really their entrant into the integrated you know, bracelet universe. So you know, it's sort of like that. They're like, oh, we made this in the past. This is the formula. We're making it a little bit bigger. What's the movement to put in there? Let's stick the let's stick, you know, um the uh, precisionist as they call it now or whatever. There's all of, it, there's so many names they call this movement now. Hmm. I, I don't is there a name now? You know, I guess it's um you know it's, they still call it precisionist, yeah. Yeah. It, it is a it is a fantastic piece of engineering. If you like the style, it's definitely going to be evocative of the 70s and things like that. I've seen these. I think they look really, really nice. Um, I think that it requires too much education to really know why this watch is cool. You first need to understand these movements. Then you need to understand Bulova. Then you need to understand this era. Then you need to understand integrated bracelet watches. There's like so many layers here. And so it is a really cool enthusiast watch, but you have to have a you have to have a pretty deep maturity in your watch collecting to truly understand this. And maybe by that point you've exceeded the price. So I think the best thing to do is for Bulova to make these fun watches so that people can downgrade into it and wear it as the occasional purple dial watch, but it's accurate. So it's sort of like and that's the perfect thing. Nobody wants to buy a three-hand quartz when it has a ticking hand. But when it does something a little bit different, people are like, okay, well, I'll do that. So I think that that's really the best play here is have this be, you know, the the the, uh, the men's equivalent of maybe a cocktail watch. Um, and I think that that would be sort of a good player. So it's a good product, but I just it's very it's in a very strange and niche um, area of the market, very competitive. So it's a so it's a six hundred dollar watch that requires more than six hundred dollars worth of understanding. That's a and good. By the time one. you put yeah. that yeah. by the time you put the effort in, you want something that's more than six hundred dollars. Yeah. Yeah, you see what I mean? You see what I mean? Yeah, it's, yeah, it's yeah. a conundrum. That's cool. Yeah, Ariel. Um, one question on this movement for you is: um, so this was used in the Lunar Pilots, which has been a, a hugely popular model for Blover for many years. But one of the big criticisms of the Lunar Pilot was always the case size. So I think it had a forty-four or forty-five mil case. Up until they did a re-release about a year ago, I think, where they brought it down by about a millimetre or two. Not very much. But the justification was always that this movement was a big movement and therefore it needed to have that big case. Now, this watch is a 40 mil, I believe. 40 millimetres. So it makes me wonder now why they didn't always do the <laughs> Lunar Pilot in a smaller size. No, the, the, the answer is they've developed smaller versions of the movement. Mm. Some of them have different battery life. Some of them operate a different frequency. Um, you know, they've been making these for a while and the Japanese, what you notice they do is they come out with something and then part of the improvement process, Cassie was really big on this is what they do. They shrink the size. So over the, the, you know, like I said, more than decade, they've been making these, they have been able to shrink them down a little bit. Um, I believe that ba the, the types of batteries that they use are an issue because the high frequency using a normal quartz battery would suck these batteries dry. So what they would do is they would be like lithium ion batteries. It would really like last like 10 years <laughs> in a normal quartz movement, but managed to squeeze out about two years um, from these sort of high power drain ones. And that's really the, I mean, think about the sleeping seconds hand. It looks cool. It's just pure high power drain. It doesn't need to do that. Um, so it, this is a high power drain system that was able to benefit from the, the, the availability of these of these small size but lithium ion batteries uh, that are quite you know quite you know large and they're able to sort of miniaturize a little bit of that. I don't think they can go too much smaller um, than this. Um, I, I'm also not entirely sure why the original Lunar Pilot was as large as it is. I agree that the smaller one um, fits nicely. They've done sort of other little tweaks to it. Uh, but again, I, I, I do know that there have been several generations of precisionist and miniaturization tends to be what the Japanese uh, put a lot of effort into. Yeah, I think the current Lunar Pilot's still a 45 mil watch, but uh, yeah, they are a bit chunky. Semantic satiation is what it's called when you say a word over and over again that it starts to sound silly. 
for no good reason. So there you go. Bizarrely, you that is the second time. You've been in the I've... background while we were just talking about well, that. <laughs> bizarre, well, yes. Bizarrely, I was recording something else earlier in the week and had already looked up that for a similar reason. <laughs> but it was a podcast on an entirely non-watch related subject. Is this your tractor but... podcast? Is, is, is that what we, yeah, yeah. we can expect? Tractors, next, tractors yeah. are us. Yeah, yeah. yeah. A blog Brilliant. to... A blog to tr- uh, yeah, blo- what would it be? A blog to track. Blog to track to- well, you could get Clarkson on that one, track couldn't you? That would be a great guess. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Reed Clarkson, yeah, yeah, that would go very badly wrong very quickly. Uh, so, <laughs> yeah, uh, just before we move on from uh, this particular boulevard, uh, the most obvious link of this into Genta, like what element of this when you look at it makes you think Genta the quickest? Is it the bezel that you look at first or is it the integrated bracelet or or any other factor of this watch? I mean, this whole era had a bunch of integrated bracelet watches that if you sort of knew about this, you don't really associate with Genta. So I don't really see this as being Genta. I see this as in the modern sense, Genta designs popularized the integrated sports, you know, bracelet, sports watch, whatever. And this is Bulova's answer to it, but I don't think they're trying to look like Genta. But yes, in general, it's like tapering bracelet, check. You know, um, geometric bezel, check. Time only dial, check. You know, like there, there's a, there's a bit of a formula. The Yema Urban Traveler series. Okay, you look at this and you think Genta again. Are we? integrated bracelet or, <laughs> or bezel or something else first i think this is Tapicity dial type yeah this is definitely more for me this definitely says genta um you know i think it's kind of i think this is following a fairly tried and tested um design formula um in this one that we've seen a lot of in recent years um i think yema have tried to put their own stamp on it i think they've got something quite interesting going on with the bezel and it's got these kind of facets cut out of it um, or recessed into it, um, which is nice. But, you know, with the kind of look of the, I don't know whether you'd call this a tapisserie style dial or have you'd refer to that and the integrated bracelet, you know, I think this has got kind of Genta influences written all over it to me. But it's a, it's a good looking watch. But somehow the when I see this in pictures, and it, this may be different when you get this in your hand in real life, but somehow the bracelet for me doesn't seem that it's quite as... I think the, the bracelet and case don't seem cohesive, if that makes sense, for an integrated bracelet watch. It doesn't quite seem to have the design flair that the case has. Yeah, I find this quite odd looking. I think it is a bit disjointed. Dare I say, it, what's that brand, the Genius, that had to change their name? Yeah. The Genius Genta? Does it, does it look a bit like that? Yeah. Does it have that kind of vibe that it's just a bit... Yeah, is is it a bit too try hard? Is that the phrase I'm looking for? Yeah, I think that's where I'm coming from with it. Um, so to give you a, a comparison, so um, I recently reviewed the Citizen Soyosa, and you know that has got a lot of influences from several different places, a lot of Rolex influences, different models, um, oyster quartz, um, you know, a whole range of different things, and then they've kind of put all of these designs into one watch and the way they've done it it really works and it just it comes together cohesively and it really works this to me looks like they've kind of taken a lot of different design influences from a lot of different places thrown them together and i don't think it works i mean sometimes this brand comes out with really cool stuff but this is a brand that through much of their history literally the formula like formula was what's popular how do we put our own little take on it and i i really applaud the vintage Yema for for doing that. They didn't want to just sort of copy. They're like, we're going to make our own version of this popular thing. And when the brand came back, it's because they could sort of do that in, in a relatively low cost way. And I think it satisfies a lot of people. But this is not, I, I think if you're already looking at certain other models, this is sort of out of it. Like Yema knows that there's a certain type of demographic that likes their stuff. But but people like us, just the, we know about too many other options. It's difficult for us to narrow it down to this. So for people that just sort of see this, it does, you know, check the right boxes and, and it is nice. Um, but it's it's in again an incredibly competitive space, and there's nothing about it that says here's why ours. But there are gonna be people that look at it and be like, that's exactly what I want. It's the right mixture of this. It looks, you know, what I like about this one, it looks really 80s. Like the one that looks the most 80s is the Yima. Mm-hmm. Okay. I mean, 
at the price that this is at so this is kind of 890 usd so it's it's in the kind of upper level of like a prx like the expensive prx's uh are maybe a or are maybe a, well, I was gonna say are smidgen below. They're about six hundred and ten quid. So by the time you convert dollars for pounds, but is this does this represent a step up from a PRX in terms of quality of construct, in terms of design language, or is it is it re, is it really not? Two hundred dollars more watch in this it's not. than there is. It's not. It's just ner it's nerdier. It's the nerdier thing. It's like I had to like get from a little brand, and they have a weird story, and I could tell it to you. And it's like, oh, you just went to the <laughs> store and got your TSO, but I had to like find some, you know, little this and that to get this one. It's just, it's <laughs> it's it's really about the buyer. Yeah, and I think maybe a more interesting comparison with this is actually go slightly higher. And you're actually really not uh -huh. far off the price of the Christopher Ward 12. Yeah. Yeah. That's a way more direct competitor. Yeah. And I think that mm -hmm. the designers of this, because, you know, they must have been probably about to launch this <laughs> just as the Christopher Ward 12 popped up. And I guess mm -hmm. when that one launched, they must have gone, ah, oh, damn. <laughs> yeah. Because that, that, that just is, I think for me, the comparison, I just feel that for a couple of hundred dollars more, I think the Christopher Ward for me feels like it offers a lot more for the money than this one does. Let let's let's remember something. There is a large category probably in the US mainly, but I'm also guessing in Asia as well of of people who who consider themselves watch lovers. But to to them are spending on average between 1 to 300 dollars per watch. And buying something that nears or goes a little bit over $1000 is sort of like many other people getting a several thousand dollar watch, meaning it is a huge splurge from them. They do it once in a while, if that, and they want something that like makes them feel like they're wearing a five or six or seven thousand dollar watch. And that's where this sort of comes in. It's not really for guys like us. It's for people that are reaching and 800, you know, 900 bucks. That is a big deal for them. And they want to feel super cool. So this actually has to remind them of a bunch of other stuff or else it's not really doing its job. Good stuff. Well, go and check out everything you need to know about this Yima, Yema. Again, it's another one of those how do you pronounce it? I don't know. <laughs> go and check out on blogtowatch.com and let us know what you think. Okay, we're going to look at something uh, that is definitively, well, I think there's no Gerald Genta references here, but maybe Ariel will be able to tell me differently. And that is a hands-on with the Cartier Santos Dumont Micro Rotor Watch in stainless steel, which I think is a sports watch, which is as far removed from Gerald Genta influences as it's possible to be. Am I correct? I mean, it's 50 years older than anything Gerald Genta did, I think, at least that. So is it, it, presumably, if anything, there was an influence the other way. Ariel joined the dots between the Cartier Santos Dumont and Gerald Genta, or are there no dots to be drawn? Why are you trying to draw dots here? I'm just asking if there's any connection. Ah, uh, investigative journalism, I see. Yes, yeah. yes. I mean, you've, you've already said that it's not your job to comment on prices. Uh, or, so I'm just wondering what it is your job to comment on. So I'm hoping it's your job to comment on at least this. I, I really couldn't tell. I wasn't with Genta. I don't know what inspired him. I don't know if he looked at, he had like a poster of the Santos Dumont, a little shrine to it. He's like, I want to be like you someday. Like, I don't, I don't know. I don't know. He might've, he might've fetishized it for all I know. <laughs> well, what do we think of this? I'm a big fan of the skeletonized Santos Dumont. I, I, I love them. I think they're absolutely epic watches. What it's, do we think it's about lovely. this micro rotor version? It's tiny. This watch is not big. I think that everyone needs mm. to understand that this is for a novelty watch it has a little spinning airplane on it. This is very little. Um, which is fine. There's there's a market for it. I I've seen plenty of skeletonized Cartiers. I've seen plenty of skeletonized Cartier Cartier Santos or Santos Dumonts. Um, have I seen one with like a little spinning biplane on it? No. <laughs> uh, I thought it was cool. It's it's weird and quirky. It, it's strange because it's done so well in person, but you're like. 
there's no story behind it. There's like, look, little plane. There's like no story behind it. <laughs> and it looks like when it's spinning, when the rotor moves, it doesn't look elegant. It looks like the, sp- the plane is flying out of control, like it's going <laughs> to crash and die. There's nothing relaxing about seeing this, you know, this crash waiting to happen. And uh, oddly enough, that is another Cartier watch, the crash. Uh, uh, <laughs> so this is kind of cool. It should be a super limited edition. I think they're just like, let's make a collector's piece for people that want a smaller case. And uh, that's that's what they did. Should this be nicknamed the plane crash then? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think, I'm trying to think whose wrist these photos are on. That's David. I think it was. It's David. Is it David's? Yeah. Yeah, we certainly have tried to find someone with slender wrists to uh, biggie it up a bit. Is this the watch that David's taken on his camping holiday? <laughs> That's right. This is the watch he's got in the forest with himself. I mean, <laughs> see, seeing crash. like this looks like something you'd see on the back. So the funny thing is, if you look at the back of the rotor, it's nothing special, but it's just like, you know, got a little polish on there. And you'd think that like when you turn the watch over, you see the little plane, but to see it on the front, it's almost jarring. It's like, wait a minute. It's like it's like the opposite of Cartier elegance. Like it looks like part of the packaging material, like, f- like fell in there. I, w- I wonder if we could like put like some loom on the tail of this plane, so that in the dark as it's spinning around, it really does look like it's on fire. Orange loom, <laughs> ready to crash. Some orange loom. <laughs> there you go. That's what it really needs: a black DLC case, some orange loom, and uh, and you then know, a whole story a about real radium girls that you had painted on there by you know with their tongue. Yeah, by I just realised that David could have just turned this into a plane crash in a forest. <laughs> Yes, what you really need is the the like Breitling uh, emergency like screw, you know, be able to fit it onto the watch <laughs> yeah. strap, so that when you crash, you can then call the emergency services. And these are not cheap. But there we go. These are not at all no, inexpensive. Not. <laughs> so the, I don't know how many versions there are here, but I remember in, in the article, you know, David's quoting uh, nearly twenty eight thousand euros. Yeah. Okay. For um. I'm trying to figure out the, the case diameter here. It's always smaller when it's square. I think it's 32, but is that kind of equivalent? It is small. 31. 31. There's no doubt. Is that 31? Look, 31 wide, a 31 yeah. 31 millimeters square isn't tiny, but it's still 31, and it it's the lugs are not going to get anywhere near the edge of your wrist. And it's um again, there is a wear out there, but it's this is this is the, literally the definition of an exotic cardiac. Good stuff. Well, go and check that out uh, at a blog to watch. We have a little bit of news before we introduce someone and before we play Hit Miss Maybe. And that is some news that was reported. Two stories. One is a report that Omega have moved on to the next stage in terms of prosecuting those they believe responsible for committing some sort of fraud during this auction process of this cobbled together Speedmaster check out a show from a few weeks ago with Periscope for more on that do we think this will go the distance gentlemen do we think we're gonna find out the murky details I'm surprised that to a certain extent Omega have not gone you know what we had a problem here and you know it's best for us if it's just never mentioned again but clearly if they're prosecuting it's gonna become public evidence as to what exactly happened and who exactly was involved do we think it'll go the distance i can't see this the swiss justice system being anything but incredibly discreet i don't think i think whatever happens it's gonna grind in quiet behind closed doors Maybe there'll be something that comes out, but I don't see anybody. I don't see them feeling like anyone gains by this being loud in public. Mm, I think for for the same reason that I think that um, this is maybe uh, it tells people that yes, look, we're doing something, but whether this will actually go to the you know to its natural progression, uh, yeah, I'm not really sure it will. And then the other story, which you can check out in Watch Pro, but which a number of people have seen uh, pop up on Instagram, will be the damage that's been caused. Very unfortunately, there's also been a death, although I'm not sure how related it is to Salita, but there was like a freak storm uh, in the home of Salita watchmaking, which appears from the photos I've seen and from the photos you can see online to have absolutely decimated the the main buildings of Salita. Ariel, are you familiar with the location? 
Yeah, I mean, these are very efficient buildings. They're made of, you know, sheet metal and things like that. I mean, they'll be able to be rebuilt. The inside of the manufacturer, I mean, these are massively heavy machines. I can't see this being something which is going to stop them for more than a few weeks. Um, they're they're a cash rich company. You know, Salita has companies giving them huge amounts of money in advance. Uh, they could literally go to their clients and be like, "Hey, you guys want your movements again? Give us some money to fix this stuff." Um, this is <laughs> this is like one of the least concerning things. Super sad that there was this natural disaster. Uh, I hope that you're right when you say it's a freak situation and this isn't a new trend. Uh, and it might mean that you know buildings need to be retrofitted. But this is this is not the this is not the company where we need to worry that there's going to be unmitigated damage. Uh, Simon, you ever been out to Chateau Lafont? No, I haven't. Um, I've, I've driven through, well, not through it, but very close to it several years ago on a, a trip to Switzerland um, with the family, but never actually um, spent any time there. I don't know why I just don't think of Swiss and natural disasters, <laughs> but uh, so very surprised when I saw this. But hopefully, everyone who has been injured uh, is recovering well, and we shall no doubt find in the out valleys. More as the time winds, goes on. the winds can get very intense in the valleys. They really can. I don't. I, I think this is heat related because uh, when when it becomes too warm, you get the cyclone effect, which can rapidly speed up the wind. So I don't know how you know how often this is going to happen. And again. These are these are Swiss structures, so they're not built to be flimsy. But oftentimes, when if it's a big something like a factory that needs a lot of machinery and cooling, you know they they want to build them as, as simple as they can to get the job done. They're not thinking about they're thinking about snow, right? Snow and cold way more a concern than something like like wind. Um, and and again, this is a large facility designed to be relatively efficient in manufacturing. Yeah, the, the weather was something that really struck me actually when I was last in Switzerland because on the drive that I was just talking about, you know, we crossed over the French border and I think it was Basel at about kind of, I think it was 33, 32, 33 degrees um, Celsius, very, very warm, climbed up the Alps. And when we got to the highest point, it was snowing. You know, there are two or three inches of snow on the ground. So there's a huge variation in both temperatures and climate um, in, in that place. Cool. Well, go and have a check out of uh, Watch Pro as always. And uh, you can see some more reporting on that from, from there. OK, it's that time of the show. We're going to play Hit Miss Maybe. And we are going to introduce a voice that you've not heard for a while because... You normally hear her doing the intros of the show, but we thought we'd get her on to actually join us for Hit Miss Maybe. Hopefully she's tuned in and is listening. Christy, are you there? Hello, everybody. A female voice on the show. Say good morning to Christy, everybody. Hey, Christy. Hello. Hey, guys. So first up on Hit Miss Maybe this week is an actually affordable, the Casio MRW200H sports watch. Ripley had a look at this for his actually affordable sports watches article. So on the count of three, you're going to need to tell me uh, as to whether this is a hit, miss, maybe. So first up, Simon, hit, miss, maybe. I think this is a hit. I don't know if I'd go and buy it, but it kind of works for me. <laughs> Good stuff. Ario, hit miss maybe. Objectively a hit. Objectively a hit. Why is it objectively a hit? Because it's about as successful as you can be for this type of watch for an extremely low price point. Like if you like tool watches, you basically have to have a soft spot for this. You you thoroughly recognize its weaknesses and how you can get a better watch for more money. But there's a <laughs> unbelievable appeal to the, the 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 focus on huge amounts of little details in such an inexpensive package, getting so many little things right. If all you ever had was this watch, you would take it for granted. We had like a bunch of other crappy watches. You'd be like, oh man, I missed that one Casio that <laughs> just did all that crap right. It's not like any Casio you're probably thinking of. It was not designed recently at all. Um it's um it's just a great basic tool watch if you ever just want to go super minimalist tool watch this is this is what to do christy hit miss maybe i'm a maybe i'm so sorry i i'm just not a casio person and i've really tried to be but i just can't oh, I, find I like a casio the maybe. i enjoy good, good. <laughs> so i i would be a miss but i feel like i can see if you're a casio person 
this is a decent watch and yes it can be improved but it's not horrific so i'm <laughs> i'm trying to elevate my opinion of this by being a maybe <laughs> okay i think it's a hit because i think largely for uh, the, the views that ariel has expressed i mean uh, look at what it does and how much it is but need you say more mm. so yeah a hit from me okay next up we have a hands-on this is the fossil watch it's the fossil star wars stormtrooper automatic watch let's go around the room this way ariel hit miss maybe uh it's kind of a miss for me it is very cool and fun it is not really wearable as a watch and i sort of like it when fossil at least tries to pretend that it's a novelty watch with the face of a stormtrooper it's as an art object it's very cool it's also very fragile with a white coating which is not designed to hold on very well so like if this is a collectible that you're supposed to take pictures of and 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 sell it in box with papers to like subsequent owners <laughs> great but like to wear in your wrist and be like boy i'm really ha glad i wore you not not there yet <laughs> Simon, hit miss maybe. This this is both a hit and a miss for me. So does that make it a maybe? It probably does. Um, yeah, yeah probably. probably does. Um, I'm not into character watches, so um, yeah, that kind of makes it a miss. Full stop. Um, but I do love Star Wars, so I'm a real geek in terms of Star Wars. Um, but what I do really like about it is I love how they've got this kind of like a faux white ceramic case and bracelet on it. So if it's IWC, yeah, yeah, right. exactly. But you know, for this kind of price point. So, I mean, I think it's actually stainless steel that's been coated. Um, uh -huh. and, Do you think? Yeah. And, yeah. <laughs> it's, probably pla it's probably plastic it's pro that's been no, coated. Yeah, exactly. But I think if you took the... No, it, I mean, it's, I, I took the shots. I mean, like, I... I oh, did you? Yeah. Was it you, yeah, you it's, a watch, right? okay. it's a steel watch. Uh -huh. It's a steel watch with a sort of a light, kind of like a Cerakote or maybe a lacquer. I mean, it is, uh -huh. it is one, like, sharp poke into a wall or a hard object from cracking right off. <laughs> and, okay. and I know this type of technique and it is about as fragile as could be. And and you know what? Making the custom molds for the ceramic to cut them the right way would have been a lot more expensive. Plastic would have been a lot more cheap. I felt like they just committed themselves to doing a white watch. Like, guys, we're going to do it. We're going to do it. Yeah. I don't know cost. why. I don't know yeah. why. Um, I just feel like, I mean, it's such, I think it's actually a cool collector's item for that purpose because it's like the the moment you wear it, you destroy the value, right? So it's like it's yeah. always going to be the unworn, <laughs> the unworn but, storm one. Can someone tell me though with this watch? So they released the first kind of line of Star Wars themed watches on May the fourth. Now I get that, you know, May the fourth be with you and all this kind of thing. But this watch appears in the second line, which was released on May the twenty sixth. So is there any connotation there that I'm not aware yes, of? Yes, yes, yes. Remember, remember. Um, uh, you know, May the 4th is not what you would call a commercial holiday, uh, but Mother's and Father's Day are. And so they figured out how do we separate this. So the first set of watches was the light side and the second set was the dark side. All right. Okay, right. So, uh, right. Okay. I mean, maybe it's fair to say that this watch is like a stormtrooper. Like, I mean, stormtroopers were never really known as being particularly uh, hard wearing. I, I am going to be controversial and say this is a hit. And the reason I think it's a hit is this is basically, this is the most bizarre time-telling situation. Like, it's like an, an a jumping hour regulator with a 24-hour time display in a second, I think. I can't actually figure out how it's telling the time. There appears to be an hour indicator in the eye of the Stormtrooper. It's only got a minute hand, so it's a regulator effectively. And I can't work out if it's a... Is it displaying like a 24-hour time? Has it got a second time zone or something on this Ariel? Ariel's Ariel disappeared. Oh, or is it an AMPM indicator? I can't work it out. Is it an AMPM? Wait, what's in the eye? So the, the eye hour. is showing the hour marker. It's only got a single hand. Oh. I'd only just noticed this. <laughs> okay, that slightly improves it for me because I'm I'm here for weird time telling things where you've got to work out. <laughs> well, Ariel has just like a stormtrooper with no resistance to anything has just vanished. I don't know if he's just fallen asleep because he was so knackered <laughs> and has basically hit his keyboard and logged out. So, Christy, uh, hit miss maybe for you on this one. I'm a miss on this. 
I used to be a really big Fossil fan before I actually got into watches. <laughs> and so I feel like Fossil can do better than this. Um, I do really love the case back on this from an art perspective, but I'm not a Star Wars fan, so I can't actually get behind it. Oh, Ariel is coming back, it would appear. Ariel, I don't know if you can hear us yet. I'm trying to discern on the Stormtrooper watch as to how it actually works and how it actually tells the time. So the hour is in the eye of the Stormtrooper. And then it's I'm really room. impressed you're still talking about this. <laughs> <laughs> and it was been gone for five minutes and we're still going. It's got a regulator hand on it for the minute track and a seconds rotating wheel. And it's a 24 is like an AM PM indicator. Yeah, it's just what the seven Friday watches used to have in the beginning. Ah, right, it's a, okay. it's a Miyota movement. Right, right. So I'm quite impressed. So I think that I think this is a hit. I quite like this. I mean, yeah, it'll not it'll survive a bit as well as a stormtrooper does uh, in front of I my mean, lightsaber. If you want to excite the 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 wristwatch wearing dreams of like a ten year old boy, like this is the watch to do it. That, okay, that's the dreams I had <laughs> as a ten year old was being excited there you by go. wristwatches. There you go. Cool. Yeah. Right, we're gonna do one more i think we're gonna do a new release the casio g-shock oneness kentucky bourbon watch simon hit miss maybe uh you know what i'm gonna introduce a new category here so this is gonna be hit miss uh-huh. maybe and yawn because oh uh, g-shock right now i used to love g-shocks i was all over g-shocks they were fantastic you could have all these different functions and you know variations and designs but it just feels to me like for the past few years, G-Shock has just been kind of churning out more and more and more versions of their popular models. And we're not getting anything new. And it's like I'm starting to become desensitized to G-Shock. You know, like when if you've got an allergy and you kind of want to try and get over it, you just kind of have more and more tiny little bits of the same thing. Well, I kind of feel like that's happening to me with G-Shocks. And it's just like... I. Just don't want to see another one, <laughs> another variation. Like, so I've just had it with them. <laughs> um, and the, you know, it's like, well, the, the whole link as well with the kind of Kentucky bourbon. And I get that with this one, that it's kind of a collab with a retailer that's based in Kentucky, from what I understand. But like, isn't that the most tenuous link to why you've then coloured it in the colour of Kentucky bourbon? Because this retailer is like a streetwear and, and trainers, sneakers retailer. So I just don't get it. Really don't get it. So big, big miss for me, I'm afraid. And I don't really get the what are you waiting on? On It's like some sort of psychology on your watch. Christy, hit miss maybe for this? 100% miss. 100% <laughs> miss. It's gross. There's <laughs> nothing good about this. The resin strap is horrible. The only good thing is that it's a G-Shock, maybe, at best. I'm glad you're with me on this, Christy. Oh, absolutely. The problem is if you don't like it and you've got it, it makes it kind of indestructible. There's no way of getting rid of it. <laughs> and that's bad. <laughs> we, huh. we want a more destructible G-Shock for when they do collabs that we don't like. Ariel, you're the G-Shock expert. <laughs> I, I, I <laughs> think, think it's a this? hit. Uh-huh. Um, in response to what Simon says, yeah, if you're excited about new G-Shocks, this is about as boring as can be because this is one of their art projects. It's a, it's a fashion project. Uh, it's about, you know, um, uh, totally celebrating how you can use the G-Shock as a palette to express certain fashionable things. And the color of whiskey is popular and it, it has a certain... Um, uh, appeal and and a lot of people you know there's 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 all these Negroni color dials and things like that and so watches that have dials or the entire watch colored like a popular alcoholic drink is not new <laughs> at all. Um, Casio doesn't have to take the risk on it. It's a retailer that sort of designs it and it's it's with exactly within the framework what they do. I recognize that this is more towards an American sentiment. So if you don't like it, that's it's like a cultural thing i sometimes see limited editions like this for you know uk stuff i'm like why do they care so much about that i'm like it's just not my culture i get it 
Um, so I think this is actually well done for what it is. The packaging is fun. Um, you know, if you are into Kentucky or American bourbon culture, then this is actually a very fun celebratory product, which is way more tasteful. If you saw a couple of months ago, um, there was a Supreme Court case in America where a dog toy shaped like a Jack Daniels bottle uh, was found to be in violation of copyright infringement um, because it looked too much like the Jack Daniels bottle. <laughs> this is something that we take extremely seriously. This is like a big deal, and this is way more tasteful than a, a dog toy, in my opinion. Well, for me, it's a it's a maybe because I do actually quite like a a nice colored strap like that resin. I quite like them. I'm not going to wear it. Think of it as amber. It's amber, amber. Amber. I'm not going to think of it. I mean, it's an alcohol relation thing. So, as someone who doesn't drink, it's not really doing it for me in, in that kind of uh, relationship. I just think but the color of it kind of kinda looks so it. like um, it reminds me of a phone case that my wife had um, on her iPhone that she left in the sun. It was like a clear <laughs> case that she left in the sun, and it kind of turned into this really like brownie orange I will, color. I will send you shots of it. Apparently, I'm going to be getting one of these, and I will I will regale you with the exact <laughs> hue that it. All right, okay. Turns out, turns out Ariel's in the pocket of Big G. <laughs> Big G, I like that. That's fun. There is somebody in the comments on the website asking what would its Scotch whiskey equivalent be? Uh, what would the Scot... I mean, if we were to do this in Scotland... Uh... Again, I don't feel I know enough about whiskey. Uh, yeah, whiskey culture. I mean, yeah. on the assumption that you weren't going to do it with it. Well, if you were going to do it with a G-Shock and Scotch whiskey and you were to be as cheesy, that they'd all, almost certainly come in like a Walker shortbread oh. package along with a whiskey miniature. And there'd have to be some tartan involved or it'd have to be in a silver wrapper like Tunnock's Tea Cakes. Or I'm thinking so like a tin. A for some reason, all like we as Scots love tins. We are obsessed with tins. That's true. Mm. Like tins of sweeties, boiled. Do you have boiled sweets in the states? Is boiled sweets in a tin a thing, Ariel? I have no <laughs> idea what you're referring to. <laughs> oh, this is so sad. <laughs> we, we we found our cultural uh, distance. A uh, you know two cultures. This separated. could also be an Iron Brew watch. <laughs> oh yeah, no! Now, now you're talking. Yes, actually, yeah. This is this would be more the the. The non-alcoholic version of this would be an Iron Brew watch. I like how it was the thumbs down to people that just didn't like what it reminded them of. <laughs> Same color, but it reminds something that's more familiar. Oh, yeah, I love it. Yeah. Oh, no, yeah so there'd, be tra- <laughs> there'd be a traffic cone involved somewhere for those of you that are aware of the cultural references. Oh, so of- good traffic cones in, and Scotland and particularly Glasgow <laughs> but that'll be something that Ariel can wonder about for the rest of today or dream about. Ariel when you wake up and you're wondering why you're thinking about traffic cones do give us a shout anyway that is us for this week <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah but it's quite interesting as soon as you relate it to something in your own culture like, yeah that's the best way to <laughs> slice bread it's like the two old geezers from the Muppet show anyway I'll not I assume who's who but there we go right what's everybody up to this week Ariel you are on the east coast at the moment I believe yes what are you doing there returning well I finished up a trip with Cuervo Sabrinos joining them to Hemingway Days in Key West which was a hoot Uh, we started writing about that so that was interesting they Gave a watch to the winner of the Ernest Hemingway Lookalike Contest, the 42nd annual of this particular event. So. I did notice I didn't see any photographs of you taking part in that contest. I uh, don't look uh, like Hemingway. Uh, you know, no, fair enough. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think so, uh, secretly from last week, Alex really wanted an invitation of that because I think he thinks he could look like Hemingway if he put enough effort into it with his yeah, cats. Yeah, not, not, I'm not a judge, can't say. Um <laughs> Here in Miami, uh, having some other meetings and going to be returning to LA um, and debating whether or not I should go for a swim at four in the morning. <laughs> good stuff, good stuff. Uh, Simon, what can we expect from you? Uh, I've got a whole stack of boring work to get through before I head off my holiday and my vacation um, on the weekend, which I'm really looking forward to. Um, so uh, yeah, 10 days in France, taking a few watches with me to, uh, to do good. some reviews on while I'm there. And um, yeah, should be good. 
What will be the daily wearer for a holiday for you? Uh, well, it's, What's a holiday watch? It's probably going to be one that's actually really surprised me. So I've just had the um, Tiso PRX Quartz on the rubber strap come in, but it's the one, the white version with the loom dial. Um, I mean, I'm really late to the whole Tiso PRX thing anyway. I don't own one, um, but I've had a couple in recently for review. This one's come in and it's like, wow, it's like £320 or something at retail. What more do you need? This has got, you know, it wears really well. It looks great. It's got a loom dial. I mean, who doesn't love a loom dial? So that's going to cool. be spending a lot of time on the wrist. Excellent. And Christy, without giving the game away, you might actually have something coming as well, watch-wise. Yeah, I was really concerned you were going to ask me what my week holds because my life is so boring in comparison. <laughs> but actually, yes, there is something in the works. So... We, we will reveal more of that later on. We'll, we'll tease it. So you might be able to hear Christy a bit more and somebody else of a female persuasion Maybe shortly on, or on the on the interwebs. I can't wait. So there we go. You will find me at Rick TikTok. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in. Do send us your thoughts, your comments to podcast at a blog to watch.com. Goodbye. Goodbye, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Bye.